I'm Kathy Horn, and today I'm going to be talking about the McQueen Spring Summer 2001 show, Galliano's Spring Summer 2006 show, and the Celine Spring 2013 show. So this was, you know, I think for a lot of people who've been covering fashion for, you know, a few decades, this is would definitely be one of the landmark shows, Kate Moss there. It was in a, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly what part of London this was in, but you walked into this space and it was uh, the audience seated all around in a glass box in the middle. Um, there was a, ref there was, there were mirrors. So the models, I don't remember if the models could look out and see us or they were just seeing a reflection or whether it was one of those two way mirror kind of things. But it was also a padded room, it was partially padded. And so that was also right away really disturbing that you were seeing this reference, you might say allusions to an insanity, an insane asylum kind of, you know, all those Hollywood movies that we've seen with Susan Hayward um, or some such. But you know, you've got the, the aspect of everything that was going on around with this, with the audience looking at this pristine box and then the gorgeous clothes that were very McQueen, the tailoring that he was doing at that time, the kind of gorgeous colors. I forgot how gorgeous the colors were in this collection. The makeup, this kind of these little caps again that had these kind of strange overtones. But actually, you know, when you're looking at the clothes, you know, the, the elements that are going around them are sort of one thing. And then the, the actual clothes are, in my memory, they, everything seems so much more extreme, but they, they don't seem extreme here now. Maybe at the time they did. And then you start seeing, so now the clothes are starting to get, you know, he always loved feathers and he loved birds. Remember, didn't, wasn't it Susie Menkes who used to get very freaked out about his being backstage with birds, I remember. His, some of his collection, she had a phobia about birds. And the McQueen shows at that point, this is fairly early, in his career and there are no notes you're sitting here you're interpreting what you know what it is women in inside of a box women women unable to get out um you really didn't know and i mean you start connecting it and so it was later on um when mcqueen would um his pr staff would give some notes to some of the reporters and then of course he was usually available backstage I don't remember going backstage. I think it was probably because I had no idea how to get backstage at this show. But usually I would go back and talk to him or sometimes I'd go back beforehand. McQueen's incredible skill as a tailor and that he actually did things all throughout his career that kept modernizing the notion of tailoring. The workmanship and the expression of sexuality and femininity and all these plays on texture with tailoring that it's just really incredible i know i suppose at some point when you're looking at collections like this now i i'm focusing far more on the clothes than i was at the time i was probably focusing on the set and sitting there we're talking 20 years ago and thinking what is this what is he saying about you know the tensions of the 21st century which had just started I don't know. I mean, now I just sort of wonder about all that. And can you just sit, and, you know, just sit and enjoy the beauty of the collection, which is what I'm doing now. This is gorgeous. All these paillettes, degradé, tulle or georgette, not quite sure. It looks like it could have been burned at the edges, not quite sure. But really gorgeous. It was exciting to be in London at that time. Because of, you know, I like always connecting things to what are, what's going on at, in, at that time, or at least trying to. So I think he was well into, um, you know, the creative force in the industry. And I think, so if, I'm, if I remember correctly, he's already done the Givenchy stint. That's behind him. And so now he's focusing just on McQueen. Gucci, if they haven't already done the deal with Gucci, they're about to do it. McQueen was very much accepted as a, um, as a, as a creative force and you weren't really sure um, about what you were going to see. Just the range of what he was doing in terms of how the set was imagined or what the theme was. 
And it's weird because I didn't, I, I think at the, in the past, I probably sat there with this collection and was very tempted. I know I wrote a piece that was really about, um, this is for the Times, um, it was all about Hussein Shalayan and McQueen and with the backdrop of the Royal Academy show and making the argument, not that I needed to make the argument, I think the argument is per perfectly valid and obvious that great great fashion is also art. And, and this show was, was exemplary of that, um, not only in the way it was staged, but in the way the whole thing was conceived, the workmanship of the clothes. I I think that's what McQueen, I think he was recognized as that. I remember talking to him in his office, this was in Clerkenwell, and in Clerkenwell I remember having a conversation with him about, um, you know, being inventive, and he said, you know, give me time and I'll give you a revolution. And I think with Lee he was always maybe fighting against that, the reality of, you know, running a big company and that's what McQueen, the McQueen company is today, as, as Sarah Burton understands only too well. I think McQueen was an artist. Um, it's what I miss. It's what I miss from his shows. You know, he was from a different time, and I had wonderful conversations with him, but they tended to be much more like in his office uh, before, you know, between the seasons. I did a piece about him um, the summer before he died. It was in the in the New York Times Magazine, and I spent a lot of time with him, you know, in his house and in the office, and we went out to lunch, and designers are, are you know, I think they, they, they tell you as much as they can, and then I think that there's always a, there's always a limit on how, you have to spend a lot, as a journalist, you have to you find, you know, you have to spend a lot of time with people in different and at different times and it not in what you can't you can never get it from one sitting obviously and and I think Lee was somewhat elusive about a lot of things um and he would sort of joke about things when I was writing about designers particularly in the early part of the century where I had done it enough you know reviewed shows and saw a lot of designers backstage um that sometimes it was just more fun to interpret it myself than then go and get the soundbite. I think the designers felt the same way. I think they much more appreciate it when you would just see it, take it away, try to get a few basic facts, you know, that you needed about things, but not get the literal interpretation because I don't think that's really possible. This was a spellbinding show, you know, that people were quiet watching it. People were electrified. I mean, they were really engaged by it um, because it wasn't all, it didn't, the time lapse wasn't very long. And you've got this incredible set. So people are like intrigued by that. The clothes are, are exquisite and they're, you know, you're not looking at a lot of repeats. You're looking at a certain amount of tailoring and day clothes, but then you're seeing a lot of change. You're looking at model. My memory is that people were really, you know, engaged by the show and totally into it. And nobody was, this was like, again, I think for many people who see a lot of fashion shows, this would be in their top, top 10, top five shows that they've seen that just push the boundaries of what a fashion show can do. You know, like your mind is, un, you know, cl clear of something. You're always got the memory of the last, you know, kind of sensational moment. I would say that with McQueen, this was one, I mean, it would be, be very difficult for him to, to top this or exceed it in the next season. I, I, don't, I don't remember the sequence of what came next. This is John Galliano's spring 2006 show held in the outskirts of Paris, it seemed to be. I mean, he always seemed to do shows that were far out in some diff distant place, like in a soundstage, as I remember, that felt like a soundstage. His shows all often, you know, whether for Dior or for his own uh, brand, had a, a very elaborate set. Some not so, but this was one that had a set. You know, we were also, I don't know, it may have been a Friday night or a Saturday night when the show was, a, you know, the Paris Fashion Week has been running for a while. You never really know what to expect with John. But the Galliano shows were often, I felt like his space to really play. Dior, he was producing 
four or five collections a year, and two of them being haute couture. So Galliano was very much a freer attitude. So he starts with this couple, and um, she's old. She's a bit older. He's younger. Here we have, I think, Lily Donaldson with an older man. Sort of the, imp the implication that he's a bit of a sugar daddy, and um, and grinning like crazy with his garters on. Still a little hard to tell what was going on or where John was headed with this. A lot of the motifs and things that he's done in the past, you know, there's always a film aspect to John's work and characters floating around. We're sort of getting used to the idea, obviously, of couples, which had been done before in, pa in fashion. Gautier did a famous show with couples of all types, male, you know, mix of genders, mix of ages. It's sort of important to think about, this is 2006, it's 15 years ago, and it wasn't so common to see different body types on the runway then. There was some of that, but now it's become, in the last few years, you know, as people have demanded to see different rep representations on the runway, it's very standard, you know, and if a designer is, doesn't have a racially mixed runway and different body shapes and different um, gender um, expressions, then it's, you know, the, it, it seems odd not to do that. But in 2006, it was much more of a surprise in a way. Again, he's sort of making these statements of people who were not regulars on a runway. They weren't the standard, you know, five foot ten model. Although many of these people, I went back and looked them up, some are, um, are were represented with agencies. There's a woman in the show, her name is Claudine Ach, she was a older woman. She's the woman in the right in the fedora, uh, the shorter, shorter of the two women. She's Claudine Ach, she was a pretty well known Act, film actress in, in Paris, did the movie Babel, among others. Again, I sort of, I love this outfit too, that both of them are wearing, the leather jacket that's been worked over the sort of classic Galliano dress. The thing that John could do so well, especially at Galliano, was that mixture of, you know, playing with things that were very dress up with things that were very street, crossing them back and forth and kind of changing your expectations of both, you know, changing the boundaries or the, the terms of both quite often in a, in a collection. I mean, this is actually clothing wise is probably fairly tame for John. The Galliano line had definitely a, a, a look to it. And, you know, it was based on those bias cut dresses that he did from the very beginning and also the sense of a sort of crazy streetwear look where he was taking, I mean, I remember the, the first shows that Galliano did in Paris. I remember the ones he did in London as well. I think that was the imprint that he laid down and then he started really playing with it. And I think John, it was his playground. I think it was his his release in a way. I don't think this would have was a surprise to actually see the the shifting of the sets. I think we were much more focused on who were these people and what was John trying to say with it. Now we're seeing sisters, I believe, who again they were represented by an agency. But this was something quite different, you know, in the fashion world at that time. This was my impression from watching the show. It's like this was really something that we weren't sure about, and I'm not sure today, in the context of today, we're more, we're more cautious. We're, we're, you know, careful about things, and I think that, I'm not sure this could ever happen today, but I think also, I think John's idea was fashion should represent more people, and I, I, I think he was right in that sense. I think we became, it became so much about these glamorous figures. Even if they were models who were dressed up in some absurdly crazy way, they were still models, they were still tall, they were still thin. But I think he was another designer very interested in getting away from the traditional ideas of what luxury is, which is very claustrophobic and very narrow-minded. We're talking about self-presentation here and here he was putting doing the same thing on individuals uh, who were the stars of his runway this is another set change getting a little cheesier I would say with all this 
you know, sheer drapery. A provincial theatre somewhere? I'm not sure what the concept, what his thinking was at this point. I mean, I sit there at, during, at the runways. There's no lineup. There's no press kit saying, uh, oh, this is what it's about, which I really love the fact that um, for the most part, designers, you might get a run of show to tell you here are the outfits and with an explanation, but all that inspiration stuff and blah, 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 blah. I love sitting at a show and just interpreting it on my own and just um, using my imagination to think where they're going, especially, if, you know, I've seen enough Galliano shows at this point to have a sense of things. And then sometimes backstage I'll ask him what was up, uh, as I would with other designers too. Colors are also a testament to what John was really good at, is mixing, mixing things and this kind of, the feeling of crushed flowers and fading flowers. He was really good at that sort of thing. And this wonderful gentleman, who can only imagine, is um, the bohemian out to see the world. You know, those those connections were, you know, to, to the art world, to the underworld, the fringe elements, the decadent world. It's very much a story of Paris and London over the last, what, two or three hundred years since the, the real birth of what we think of as fashion. My memory is, is that I didn't remember people, that some people were smiling, some people were not, so they were a little unsettled by it, like what are we supposed to think? Was he mocking these people because they were so, they weren't your sort of typical images of beauty or glamour? Not that we're such prudes that we haven't seen something like that, but he's putting it out there on the runway. And again, today, I'm not sure anyone would sort of be interested, but we lived at a different time, which is, you know, 15 years ago. The show is winding up and um, this this couple who obviously are going, uh, they're being, they've been wed or they seem to, you know, she's the bride, the traditional bride. And the show is winding down. And I'm sitting there. By this point, I love the show. And I'm I'm just taken with the fact that he's put out this expression of a different world and characters and things I've been mentioning here. So I'm kind of, you know, just smiling on the side of the runway and watching. But the best is yet to come, actually. And my memory is, is that, you know, the music was quite sort of jazzy and the person holding the marionette sort of manipulated it in a way to make it move. I guess it is now moving. It just made me laugh. I thought, you know, who's pulling whose strings? And, you know, this is 2006 and by then, we are all well aware that of the LVMHs and the PPRs, which is now the Caring Group and Gucci Group. And this was, you know, here's John in his Sid Vicious t-shirt coming out. And I, this is the first show, one of the very few shows I stood up for. And I think John is, he sort of turned to me at that point, but I, I, I no one else was standing, but I stood up. I just was like, I have to, you know, I, I was so moved and touched by, you know, the vision or the the view of this, of, of really humanity, of seeing different types of people and characters and different expressions of beauty. And, and then this funny gesture at the end with the marionette, John on strings, John being manipulated. That's how I saw it, about, saw it, and I think that's how I ended up writing about it. But it was funny afterwards Right afterwards, we're all getting up. I, you know, I was going to head backstage and talk to John. He felt that these, that the people were, you know, were quite, I think his word was monstrous. I mean, I think that it, he wasn't condemning the idea of having a mixture of people on the runway. I think he was upset that we were celebrating people who were um, so extreme whether it was like this unusually tall man, women who were quite curvaceous and lush looking and older gentlemen who looked a bit, you know, dodgy, you know, whether it was like the grand dame and the gigolo or the lipstick lesbians or, you know, you're kind of like, again, today, in today's world, we, we, I think, want as much of this, but we're more cautious about how we present it um, because we don't want to, be seen biased or 
racist or and, and that's all good. I think John was just really going for a a much more inclusive sense of the types of people who are you know in the world. We talk about self-expression but to me it's really the, the wonders of performance and people creating their own space in the universe. I, I think that's really what it was about and again I think it's the timing, you know, we haven't, you know, fashion really hadn't embraced this. Um, fashion was always this exclusive, wonderful, separate, hard to reach, um, very snobby. It thrived on all of that. And John was putting out something quite different. This was a really interesting show. It was different for Phoebe Philo at Celine. She was showing at a, a fabulous apartment uh, on the Avenue Foch, which was different than what we associate, which was the Tennis Club of Paris, where she did a lot of her shows. But that wasn't the really the only difference. First of all, she had been doing some fairly structured clothes and, uh, you know, minimalism, a kind of contemporary version of minimalism. And then out comes this show, which was one of my favorites that she did. You know, much more unstructured, relaxed, these pants that sort of droop down. I mean, some of the looks, you know, were, again, the tailoring. I think there were like four jackets in the whole collection. It was a lot about these knotted t-shirts or tops. There's one coming up here that's quite good. This satin sort of a mixture of there's a, there's another one of the matte and shine but you know the hems were in many of the cases were left unfinished this is fishnet coming up just this very sort of simple dress but kind of sexy sexier than we, we were used to for from Celine this dress was gorgeous quite heavy I went to the showroom afterwards to look at it and it was wool and perhaps rayon and super heavy but really feminine, a different kind of fluid line for Phoebe. You know, we if you look at a lot of the, this is such a gorgeous dress with the fringed, unfinished hem. This was just also a, um, a little popover top here, which was really, again, very different for her. I think she described it at some point, probably afterwards, that it was about togetherness, friendship, beauty, and a journey. I kind of just dwelled on the journey part. I mean, it, it, I, I really felt like I was wanting to go somewhere else. Again, I, for some reason, I thought Los Angeles, California, somewhere, um, that it was a vibe that was just different for her. Of course, everybody talked about the, sh the shoes in the collection, the fur pumps that were quite surreal, the slides, the, her kind of version of a Birkenstock that style anyway. You know, to me, this was just a, a, a very refreshing break of from what she had been doing. I thought, um, you know, Phoebe's often very instinctive about how she does things, but I just thought this was in a way somebody trying to move a little bit away from the structure of fashion and the, you know, to come up with something that was more personal, more feminine. And it had a good reaction, I remember, to the show. I thought it was just good for designers to sort of break out of what they're doing. And this, but the whole very relaxed vibe, I just, it's, this show has stayed in my mind. I mean, I've often said with Phoebe, you know, I, I always felt like I never could exactly say what I felt about the collection. I mean, I just felt like you know, it was she was it was a challenge to really come away from writing a review thinking that I had really nailed what I wanted to say, and I think that was the the sort of mysterious, elusive quality about Phoebe's work that, and that's why so many so many women and men loved looking at her collections because it wasn't easy to break them down. I mean, it was a, very much a gut reaction to things. But I feel like, in, you know, in the course of looking at a lot of collections over a season, I'm always looking for something that, you know, project, projects far beyond, you know, the commerce side of fashion, something that is addressing something in fashion that we haven't seen. I certainly felt with this collection that she did that. I, as I said, I went back to the showroom the next day 
I felt that she was proposing such a different lifestyle in these clothes. I felt there was such a yearning as on the part of the designer, part of Phoebe. This look was amazing. But the message was all about trying to escape, to me, this the, the kind of uptight fashion that you can often associate with, you know, the French establishment. She, so here she is showing right in the middle of the, the the thickest part of it and these very relaxed clothes that I kept thinking California and, and I actually wrote that I think it, you know later on as I look back on this collection I thought I kept wondering had Phoebe spent some time in Los Angeles and that this was her way of saying I I want to go somewhere else I certainly wanted to go somewhere else I wanted to take all these clothes and go with them this one I felt was was to me the standout collection that she did it probably hard to to duplicate it, hard to hard to surpass it. I think, you know, Phoebe, there was so many, she did a show people would just, you know, salivate for. They'd just love to see something like this again, that kind of femininity and sensuality, but in a very modern vein, like it's informal, you know, it's not all done up. I sort of wonder if it could happen again today. Fashion is a long story, it's a long history, and of course somebody could come along and we, you know, if we think back to like the kinds of things that Albert Albaz was doing at Lanvin in the early parts of the 21st century, you know, a lot of unconstructed things, very simple things, t-shirts, you know, the t-shirt reworked a lot of ways. I think, yeah, it's, it's possible. I mean, I think so much of fashion just ends up being about timing. And some people say this is, this is a, you know, it takes a woman to do this kind of thing. I'm not so sure that's true, but you know, it took, we had Phoebe doing this kind of thing. And from Phoebe, she was such a reliable guide for so many, so many people. I mean, customers as well as editors and the people who make their business copying high fashion designers. I mean, she just, she gave so much authority to things. But I would definitely love to see something, love, I'd love to see things like this. You know, I'd love to see this idea, ex, you know, explored, makes me think a little bit of Margiela. It felt like a collection that wasn't overthought. It felt very sort of, there was a lot of refusal in this collection of like, let's just do what is beautiful and not go off into, I mean, it's only 31 looks in this collection. The music, by the way, was Depeche Mode, useless which is kind of interesting. How gorgeous is that? It's actually rare in fashion. It's just rare to look at one and say, this still feels valid today. And I mean, you, you don't necessarily expect to wear clothes from 20 years ago today. I mean, it just doesn't quite work out. Proportions change, ideas change. But there is a general spirit that comes through that you're looking for and you think, yeah, I would love to see some of these things again that sort of, that sort of still feel right. And it still feels like a very personal, individual expression of things. I think that this is one of the things when she left and I wrote a piece for the, for the cut that, and I had so much fun writing that piece because I finally said what I had been like trying to say about Phoebe's collections that I never could really put my finger on what it is that, you know, that made her clothes interesting and uh, and I always felt a little dissatisfied with the reviews, like I just didn't quite say it. And there were things, obviously some collections I just wasn't, didn't warm up to that much. But I, I think that is the, the magical thing about a designer that you're able to, you know, see an aesthetic, number one, that they are able to put across. I mean, that is probably the most important thing. And then it's the feeling of, you know, do they connect with the times? Women's clothes have been interpreted and interpreted. Women's lives have been interpreted, particularly across the 20, 20th century. It's the modernizing of women's clothes is, you know, it's probably the, the main theme of the, 21st, of the 20th century, starting with um, maybe Poiret, but definitely with Chanel and all those amazing women designers of the late 20s and 1930s, Madame Grey, Elsa Scaparelli, Madeleine Viennet. I mean, the impact that they had on modernizing the form of how present clothes. And I think, I think Phoebe did a lot of that with her collections. You know, somebody who was just really astute about 
how women, smart women, women who are out in the world, women who know a lot about clothes and self-presentation, how they want to dress. It's an, it's an ongoing thing to, this, to the message that season, to the shift that she might be doing. Or, um, and quite often it felt like a shift of attitude. Like this, was, this collection is a classic case of that. 